Welcome back to Primary Source China Investment. Everybody's back. Peng Guo is back from holiday. We're here live with a new show, show Q3. And there was some activity going on in the indexing and uh, delisting environment this week. And we wanted to get into it because this is going to continuously be uh, an evolving space for those indexes and obviously the products that are generated off of those indexes. So first up was MSCI on Thursday. And you know, remember, MSCI is the leading pusher and main beneficiary of adding A shares to indexes. So they announced that three of the largest additions to the EM index, this is a massive EM index, followed by a lot of uh, funds and ETFs, will be adding three Chinese names. When I say Chinese names, I mean mainland names. This is a Tianxi Lithium, Qinghai Salt Lake Industry, and uh, Beijing Pongrentang. So these three companies are now going to be in the EM index. And the EM index, for those of you not familiar, represents 24 countries and 1,300 securities. China, broadly defined, represents 32% of the EM index. A quick look at the top 10 holdings of the MSCI EM index, none of those names are listed on the mainland, which reinforces our point about China's beta problem we covered a few weeks ago. Peng Guo, is there anything you wanted to add about uh, the, these changes and these names? I think from the MSCI index methodology, uh, in my personal opinion, I think uh, China mainland market share should be larger than uh, expected. If you compare the S&P and uh, Russell, or especially FUSI, like the global index, you will see the China's uh, weight probably uh, like the much more higher than the uh, mainland uh, or China-related securities compared in the MSCI. Uh, so I think uh, it's a uh, it's okay for them to add the more securities based on their methodologies, and obviously China's weight will get the higher. But I don't think that um, at least right now not a big impact on the entire MSI Emerging Market Index. Mm -hmm. But if you see more closely, it's really based on the methodology. So if they change the methodology in the future. Uh, that will significantly have the impact for the uh, weight in the different country. But right. overall, China always get the largest market cap in the entire the emerging market, so much higher than any other country. Right, and that that make that makes sense, right? It's got the biggest companies, it's got the biggest economy. the 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 problem that that I keep bringing up to anybody that'll listen is you're getting the wrong names in these indexes, right? If we just look at the top 10 names in the EM space, some of them are, you know, China broadly defined listed in Hong Kong, um, but they don't have the biggest names on the mainland in, in the top. And also, you know, EM covers a lot, like we said, 24 countries and 1300 securities. So, you know, maybe this is, this is an outdated model for accessing China. And you know we've discussed this in the past, and you know we don't need to rehash that today. But there was also another thing that happened on Friday. Four large state-owned enterprises announced that they were delisting from the U.S. exchanges: PetroChina, China Life, Sinopec, and Chowco, the big aluminum company. That represents about 50 billion in market cap. That's big news, and that's based on all of the regulatory issues that China and the U.S. are discussing or have been discussing. And it looks like this pattern of the large companies are going to delist, relist back on the mainland in Hong Kong is, is, is in play. Uh, yeah, that seem, just seems like they cannot reach the, some agreement for both parties. So those companies get delisted. I think it's actually it's a loss for everybody, for all the participants. Those are the state-owned companies. So they lose the biggest uh, uh, capital market for the U.S. investors, if you want to get the same exposure or diversification, they probably pay higher costs. Uh, if you buy the, uh, any securities from Hong Kong market, uh, I think it should be much more expensive than directly purchase from the U.S. market. And also the valuation in the Hong Kong market should be lower than the U.S. market. Mm. But China also done a lot of things to do the, to connect this uh, financial market. So recently, China uh, improved like the trading uh, trading days between the details of the uh, connection Shanghai Shenzhen and Hong Kong connections. So that means the trading days and uh, uh, the money flow in flow out should be much more easy. 
So it, it so it's always get some kind of a, like that balance. <laughs> Just from a listing perspective, and you know, you may say it's it's bad all around, but. Just logically speaking, there's no reason that the biggest aluminum company in China needs to trade in, in the U.S. It, it just doesn't need to happen that way. Initially, when a lot of these companies went public, this was, you know, the U.S. market was the logical place to do that. I don't think that that makes sense anymore. You know, you have deep liquid markets on the mainland. You have deep liquid market. Well, not as deep and liquid in, in Hong Kong, but you definitely have enough capital to to soak up the demand for these companies. And and they 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 probably should be listed on the mainland or in Hong Kong. And, and that probably makes sense going forward. It'll also be easier to allocate from a U.S. investor perspective. You'll know where these companies are and you'll be able to buy them easily. Like you said, all of these stock connects are harmonizing, which is actually very good for investors. Yeah. And uh, don't forget that politicals or some other relationship has a cycle. Maybe a few years later, they think let's do real estate and back to U.S. market. Who knows? That's or, all you know, I, I mean, what we're all waiting for is when can you buy, you know, J.P. Morgan or Microsoft or Apple on a China exchange? Yeah, that's 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 also some kind of the possibility. So you never know. Mm. Right. So just just to follow up on on these names, remember the the China companies listed in the U.S. There's 250 names, so that's a lot of names. Total market cap is about a trillion now after the, you know, the supposed tech wreck and all the educational companies and those kind of things. Interestingly, the smallest 100, so 100 stocks, have a total market cap of 2.5 billion. So these are very, very small companies. R remember, a company like Baidu or Neo, their market cap each is 50 billion. So you have 100 companies with 2.5 billion in market cap. These are small. Most of these are thinly traded. They trade below a dollar. Anecdotally, though, there are a few names that have huge volume, sort of meme stocks, if you will, um, Chinese meme stocks trade in the U.S. You know, you can check out T-A-N-H, M-O-H-O, C-S-C-W, you know, P-E-T-Z. There's a number of them that are out there, S-I-S-I. -S -I. Uh, they're all probably going to zero. So all of these names that are listed don't necessarily have a home because they're not going to be able to comply with the regulations. They're not going to be able to comply with the listing requirements in Hong Kong or the mainland because most of them don't make money. That's right. In China, equity market is quite similar like the U.S. market. It's become like the leading companies. They get the higher valuations. Like the SMID used to, uh, to be hot, but right now is totally not getting the attention uh, from the uh, investors. That really reflect a small and the medium company. They made a, a much harder situation and a much more stronger competitors uh, from the bigger uh, companies. Right. Same thing like the U.S. market, a few top tech companies, the, the market share is much larger than all the rest of the companies. Correct, correct. But I mean, e even worse is that most of these companies would be described as penny stocks. You know, they have yeah, their market true. cap is a few million dollars. It's just tiny stuff. And, you know, I just want to I, I want to end with something, you know, helpful, useful to our listeners. You know, a lot of people like to quote, quote Wayne Gretzky, you know, skate to where the puck is going to be. There was a Barron's article this week, and I'll put a link to that, uh, saying that the analysts were flummoxed by Beijing as they were buying China stocks in anticipation of stimulus. There are so many things wrong with this kind of thinking and this kind of writing, but our listeners know what's happening. Chinese stocks will be listed on the mainland in Hong Kong. Smaller companies that probably should never have been listed or have compliance issues will be gone. And when analysts they were referring to in this article were saying, oh, China's going to have stimulus company coming. That's why we're going to buy Chinese stocks. When they say Chinese stocks, they continuously, erroneously think about those large tech names that have taken all the oxygen out of the room. And on this show, we've been constantly talking specifically about those large A-share companies. And the move by MSCI, to me, is this, another signal that A-shares is still the place to be going forward when looking at Chinese stocks? I think that small companies is really in pretty hard situations right now. If you want to purchase a stock based on the stimulus, that's really like the hedge fund strategy uh, <laughs> event driven. Yeah. So it's just a buy it and sell it. 
Uh, I think uh, overall, a lot of investors are still looking for the long-term value and uh, growth. So, but a good thing is for China, they still have many areas uh, to growth. You have to do like the deep um, fundamental uh, research and uh, find the, the growth uh, areas. Obviously, you need to choose in the right uh, place. Uh, because uh, they're not uh, like the U.S. market, they grow slowly. So if you're not prepared um, very well in advance, mm, yeah, the market, if it gets up like the uh, a few days, they, they probably increase like the 20, 20 uh, uh, percent. You cannot keep up with it. Yeah. yeah I think it's high pretty high. hard to uh, increase the uh, difficulty or uh, skill required from the uh, international uh, in investors. So it's not uh, that easy to buy the hold and make the money. Yeah, I, I think the other thing is, you know, picking stocks is that's a that's a that's more than a full time job that requires a, a exactly. huge, a huge amount of resources. And particularly for China, it's very, very difficult to get, re, you know, real time information, you know, they don't have analyst calls and things like that. So it's not so easy to do that. So if people are just looking to allocate, you know, the smart way to do that is, you know, pick some themes, maybe some sectors, um, and, you know, maybe some large caps, but mainland stocks. And I, I think we, I want to continue to stress that for, for people tuning in. So with that, we're going to leave it here for Q3. Thanks for tuning in. Welcome back. Have a great finish to the summer. Thank you.